Hello, everyone. I'm David. Welcome to class. Paradise Lost is an epic poem written in 1667 by John Milton. It starts out when Lucifer, God's favorite angel, formed a rebellion and tried to overthrow God. After Lucifer failed, he was cast out from heaven and fell down to hell. He decided that it is better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. After he designed hell, he changed his name to Satan and traveled to the Garden of Eden to try and corrupt God's newest creation, humans. Satan transformed into a snake and approached the woman named Eve, who was walking alone in the garden. He knew that God did not want her to taste any of the apples from the tree of knowledge. Satan thought the best way to anger God would be for humans to rebel against him. He spoke to Eve and persuaded her to bite into an apple from the tree of knowledge. Before Eve bit into the apple, she was not good or evil, but neutral. The taste of this apple would give her both good and evil qualities. Eve gave in to the temptation and took a bite. She then convinced Adam to also bite an apple from the tree of knowledge. After God discovered what they had done, he was furious. He cast them out of the garden and made them suffer thirst, hunger, disease, tiredness, fear, and death. God said to Adam and Eve that this was their punishment and the human race would have to suffer until God felt they were ready to return to the Garden of Eden. From this story, one might wonder if it was a good idea for Eve and Adam to bite the apples from the Tree of Knowledge. If they decided not to, we can only assume they would live forever in bliss. But is that what humans would want? Biting into the tree of knowledge shows how humans crave to learn, to grow, and to experience all of the good and bad aspects of life. Perhaps we should thank Satan for helping us to commit the original sin. Perhaps humans are destined to be both good and evil. To look at this relationship between the good and evil in humans, we will look at a famous experiment in popular psychology. We will also look at the conflict of good and evil in literature. There are three parts to this lesson. Part one will review the Stanford Prison Experiment. Part two explores some examples of the Stanford effect in daily life. In part three, we will investigate good and evil in literature. Most people will usually consider themselves to be good and not evil. We like to think that we treat others with respect, care about the environment, and have empathy for creatures of other species. However, a famous experiment exposed to the world how evil is lurking just below the surface of normal people. This evil may be revealed when people are put into positions of power over others. The Stanford Prison Experiment was a role-play experiment conducted at Stanford University in 1971. The objective was to analyze the behavior between guards and prisoners in a simulated prison environment. As our course reveals, it is one of the most important experiments in the history of psychology. The results of this experiment shocked experts in the field of psychology and quickly became very famous around the world. 
the Stanford Prison Experiment, and the surrounding story inspired many different television documentaries, two major Hollywood films, a novel, and even the name of a band. It is usually featured in modern Introduction to Psychology textbooks due to its notoriety. The experiment began by recruiting male students from the campus and financially compensating them for their time and participation in the experiment. They selected 24 of the most normal-seeming individuals without any mental or physical irregularities. Half of the 24 participants were chosen to be guards, and half were chosen to be prisoners. Their roles were determined by a random 50% chance, so that each participant had an equal chance of becoming a guard or a prisoner. Each of the guards received a uniform and mirrored sunglasses. The prisoners got plain outfits and lived in a standard prison cell for the duration of the experiment. The experiment was planned to last between 7 and 14 days. The professor running the experiment, Philip Zimbardo, gave instructions to the guards before they began. You can create in the prisoners feelings of boredom, a sense of fear to some degree. You can make them feel that their life is totally controlled by us, and they'll have no privacy. He later said, We're going to take away their individuality in various ways. In general, what all this leads to is a sense of powerlessness. That is, in this situation, we'll have all the power and they'll have none. On the first day, the students were not very serious about their new roles. The prisoners and guards felt awkward, and as they performed basic daily prison routines, they behaved as normal university students would. However, on the second day, the experiment became much more intense. The prisoners started to rebel against the guards, who had to decide how to handle this defiance. The guards thought of some creative ways to control the prisoners, such as by isolating them, making them take off their clothes, denying them meals, and even not allowing them to use the bathroom. Throughout the experiment, the prisoners were never referred to by their names, but by numbers assigned to them. The guards strictly enforced this rule, which took away the prisoners' individuality and their connection to normal life. It also dehumanized the prisoners, making it easier for the guards to act more viciously towards the prisoners with less feelings of compassion. A key change in the behavior of the guards occurred when they began to think of the prisoners as dangerous people. The guards felt they were justified in using force. They began to behave in what can only be described as evil ways. As the experiment continued, the guards acted more and more immorally. As the course describes, the interactions between the prisoners and the guards had become hostile and degrading. The guards had become aggressive and brutal, and the prisoners were passive and depressed. One of the guards became nicknamed John Wayne, a reference to the famous American cowboy hero. This student decided to push himself to see how ruthless he could act in this position of power. He admitted to having fun in this role, not acting on his own behalf, but simply playing the part of an evil jail guard.
After the third day of the experiment, some of the students in the prisoner role started to have mental breakdowns at a rate of about one a day. They would scream at the cameras to let them out of the experiment, at which point the academics would release them. However, for all the other students, the experiment continued on. Christina Maslach, a graduate student who later became married to Professor Zimbardo, came to observe the experiment on the sixth day. After seeing the actions of the students through the cameras, she was completely shocked. She could clearly see the mental abuse that was being put on the prisoners and was horrified by the behavior of the guards. She threatened to never speak with Zimbardo again if he did not stop the experiment immediately. This snapped Zimbardo out of a sort of trance and he decided to stop the experiment immediately on the sixth day. Zimbardo realized that he had become a kind of prison guard, controlling the experiment and subjecting students to extreme abuse. None of the academics observing and assisting Zimbardo from the beginning of the experiment suggested to stop under moral grounds. Only a person with an outside perspective could notice how evil the behavior of the students had become. One surprising detail is that the guards knew that they each had a 50% chance of being chosen as a guard and a 50% chance of being chosen as a prisoner. Therefore, each of the guards were just as likely to be the prisoners as they were the guards. They also knew that the prisoners had not actually committed any crimes and were just regular students, the same as them. This calls into question the power of the experiment, how it affected the way these students were behaving based on the roles they were given. Zimbardo's understanding of what happened during this experiment was that good people do terrible things due to situational influences and power given from authority. As our course explains, given a position of power, people can begin to behave differently than they normally would. Soon after the experiment was completed, there were prisoner riots in Attica in New York State and San Quentin in California, two of the largest and most famous prisons in America. Zimbardo spoke to the American government, trying to expose the intense psychological challenges people face in a prison environment. The Stanford Prison Experiment showed that when in a position of power, even good people can do terrible things. This is commonly referred to as the Stanford Effect. This effect can also be applied to people's behavior in daily life. A common situation where power dynamics can result in cruel treatment of others is bullying at school and in the workplace. At school, a bully's power often comes from their physical size and strength. A typical schoolyard bully is a larger boy who can easily dominate others physically. In most cases, a schoolyard bully does not need to use any physical force to dominate their victims. Other students are aware of the bully's strength, which gives the bully power. This may cause the bully to be cruel to other students, similar to how the guards were cruel to the prisoners in the Stanford experiment. In the workplace, the bully often has a position of power through seniority over others. In this case, the victims may feel they cannot report abuse to anyone because that may put their job at risk. While the ways of power obtained may differ, the effect is the same.
So, if these results of the Stanford Prison Experiment show how easily a normal person will mentally and physically abuse others when given a position of power, what can we do to lower the occurrence of bullying at school and in the workplace? One way is to pay close attention to how a school or workplace is organized and how different social situations can cause bullying. As the psychologist Janice Harper said, we must dare to step beyond the boundaries of the individual bully paradigm to consider how group psychology contributes to workplace aggression and turns good people bad. Another way is to ensure that people in power are properly supervised. For example, when school bullies are identified by teachers, they can identify the deeper issues of the students and work to eliminate cruel behavior. While proper supervision keeps people accountable for their actions, one place where supervision is often impossible is the Internet. With the rise of social media digitizing people's social lives, cyberbullying has become a difficult issue for today's generation. While teachers can watch for bullying at school, they cannot keep track of students' behavior online. While the Stanford Prison Experiment took place years before the Internet was created, one thing they had in common was that the people performing cruel actions were anonymous. To be anonymous means that no one knows your identity. In the experiment, the guards wore large mirrored sunglasses. This made it impossible for the prisoners to make eye contact with the guards, hiding their identity. This anonymity took away some of the consequences of behaving in a cruel way, such as shame. Similarly, because of the anonymity provided by the Internet, people are more likely to make hurtful comments. This allows individuals to protect their reputation as a normal, good person while allowing them the freedom to be cruel to others. Some believe that people behave in good or evil ways due to the different chemicals in the brain. Oxytocin is a chemical which gets released in the human brain when people feel socially accepted. This chemical is also responsible for feelings of empathy and bonding with each other. Therefore, some experts believe this chemical influences human behavior towards being kind to others. Conversely, testosterone is a hormone found in both men and women, with higher levels in men. This chemical is responsible for aggressiveness and competitiveness, which likely contributes to actions that harm others. It is worth noting that all of the participants in the Stanford Prison Experiment were males, and it was a female who empathized with the prisoner students. The Stanford Prison Experiment was an important study into the evil present within human beings. Fictional literature has also analyzed the relationship between good and evil. Through the medium of stories, the author tries to enlighten the reader to better understand themselves and the world around them. Fiction is a reflection of reality where human characters can represent greater ideas and attitudes. In fact, almost all fictional stories have a good hero and an evil villain. These are formally known as the protagonist and the antagonist. The protagonist is the character who the reader identifies with and cheers for throughout a novel. They usually have a strong moral code and represent justice and order in society. 
there is often a love interest for the protagonist at some point of a story. The antagonist is the source of conflict in a story, who usually wants to destroy the protagonist, seize ultimate power, and cause harm to innocent people. The character is a human representation of evil. After the conflict is created, the story becomes a battle between good and evil personified into human characters. Fictional stories are usually told by the protagonist's point of view, such as in the novel Lord of the Flies by William Golding. In this novel, a group of British schoolboys are traveling to escape a dangerous situation in Europe during World War II. When their plane crashes and the pilot is killed, the boys become stuck on a remote island with no adult authority. The boys are initially peaceful and work together in a democratic society. The protagonist, Ralph, is one of the oldest boys who is a natural leader with good morals. The boys vote Ralph to be the leader or the chief. He then assigns the boys tasks such as collecting fruit and vegetables and building shelter. However, another boy named Jack becomes tired of eating fruits and vegetables and wants to hunt the animals for meat. This causes the boys to split into two groups and fight with each other. The society they created descends into violence and the boys learn how quickly reason and order can turn into chaos. In a final act of pure evil, the antagonist, Jack, sets fire to the entire island, ensuring that all of them will soon be killed by starvation. Suddenly, a British naval officer in a pristine white uniform arrives on the beach of the island and is shocked at how the British-educated schoolboys could descend into such anarchy. The officer then rescues the boys, who tearfully explain how two of the boys were killed by their violent actions. The British officer is in complete shock over the behavior of the boys. He could never have imagined British schoolboys descending into such savagery to the point where they destroy the entire island. However, the irony is that the officer himself is engaged in a very similar conflict between civilized nations during World War II. Much like the boys on the island, the war killed innocent people. It also nearly resulted in the complete destruction of civilization by total nuclear annihilation. While most stories, such as Lord of the Flies, are told from the protagonist's point of view, some are told by a third person in the story. An example would be The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. The whole story is narrated by a reputable lawyer named Gabriel John Utterson. The story begins with the lawyer chatting with his friend about the strange, aggressive behavior of a sinister man named Mr. Hyde. He notes that there are some odd connections to the upstanding gentleman, Dr. Jekyll. After Mr. Hyde's aggressive behavior results in a murder, Dr. Jekyll starts acting very strange. The lawyer then travels to Dr. Jekyll's house. He discovers that the doctor has committed suicide and left a farewell letter. This letter reveals what has really been going on throughout the novel, where Dr. Jekyll has been taking a potion that allows him to turn into the evil Mr. Hyde so he can live out his aggressive fantasies without feeling any sense of guilt. At first, Mr. Hyde returns into the form of Dr. Jekyll and is able to keep the two identities separate. However, as time goes on, he has difficulty controlling the evil beast inside, to the point where he transforms more and more at random with no potion. 
After Dr. Jekyll can no longer control his evil alter ego, he made the decision to commit suicide in order to protect the society from the evil beast he has released within himself. One interesting point about this story is that the protagonist and the antagonist are really the same person. Perhaps this is true in our own lives, that we are our own worst enemy. The history of the world has plenty of evidence to prove that the devil exists, which can be found inside each and every human being. Thankfully, there is no way to transform our evil into a monster, but this leaves humans with an internal struggle between good and evil that will last our entire lives. In today's lesson, we learned how the Stanford Prison Experiment revealed the evil behavior of normal people when put in a position of power. We then looked at how the Stanford effect exists in different situations in daily life and how to reduce its negative effects. We also looked at how good and evil are presented in stories including Lord of the Flies and the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The characters in those stories represent the struggle between good and evil in human beings. All right, that's the end of the lesson today. I hope you enjoyed it. I know this was one of my favorite lessons. Thank you very much for listening. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.